Hey there, friendlies. How's up? Welcome to the 10th of November episode of the Beer Blades of Bushcraft live stream. I'm just trying to get my desk organized here. I was a little rushed to get here tonight. <laughs> um, so I um, tonight's subject is um, inspired by the computer that I'm doing this on right now. Um, as those of you who've been watching me for a a while now know that I do my work and everything on a Hackintosh. A Hackintosh, for those of you who don't know, is a Mac OS machine that is built from PC parts rather than <coughs> an Apple branded computer. Um, the magic of Apple having switched to Intel like a decade or more ago now is that um, they're just off the shelf. PCs in many ways. Very highly designed. Um, like if you pop one of these babies open, um, it's not a run-of-the-mill PC at all. Uh, their tolerances are very, very tight. Um, heat is, is an issue, so they've designed all these really wicked cooling systems, blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, you could save a thousand bucks like I did by putting a bunch of parts together that will work and installing Mac OS. Um, it's not easy. Keeping them going is not easy, evidently. Uh, and I did a video this week saying, don't don't Hackintosh unless you really know what you're doing. And I stand by that statement. Absolutely. Um, I feel that <coughs> if you're not a, um, if you're not a bit of a computer hobbyist, don't do it. I'm just gonna move over and sort of center myself a bit better. Um, but I, you know, so I ganked my computer pretty hard doing something as simple as updating the operating system. On Thursday, I think I have found a way forward. Um, it required me to buy an external case for my hard drive, but I think I can save my stuff and just do a reinstall. I will keep you guys apprised. Um, I have been asked, well, why don't you just use Windows, dude? And it's because uh, there's a, a comfort in use thing that I feel very um, very strongly about. Uh, I don't feel creative in Windows at all. Um, Windows is something I work in when I'm taking other people's money. And Mac OS is what I work in when it's um, my own creativity. This comes from years and years and years of working in design where everything happens on Mac OS. Um, <coughs> excuse me. That's not really bushcraft related, right? Uh, so, uh, but I'm not going to bore you guys with computer talk all night. But where it it interfaces with my channel is this is the computer that I put my channel together on. Um, on the Mac disk is where all my the tools I used to create are, and I can't access them right now. Um, so as I sort of said in my in my video. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to shoot in 1080p and probably use my laptop for the next little while until I get this squared away. Shooting in 4K um, is a non-starter on that laptop because it's from 2013. <coughs> but anyways, I'm optimistic that I'm going to be able to you know, bring this baby back from the dead. Um, let's just take a moment to say hi to everyone. Johnny Harper was, was here. Uh, uh, he was here first. I think he may have gone away and he'll be back though. Cause he said, hi at like seven 23. Uh, there's a big hour difference between where I am in Montreal and where Johnny is in Hawaii. Grace. How's it going? Tyler. Nice to see you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hey, Mike Morton's here tonight. Nice. Um, Martin is here as well. Uh, <laughs> Tyler. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, when everything sort of went to hell with the computer, I was frustrated. Um, and this is where it sort of comes into that thing that I say every now and again about how develop a skill, develop a skill because the skill involved in developing skills is transferable. And almost every skill that you develop 
develops you in in a more general sense that can then be brought to to other um, skill sets, other contexts, other things to do. <clears throat> and so when the computer ganked on me, I did the um, the equivalent of you know that thing where they say if you if you ever find yourself lost in the woods, stop, sit, drink some water because it'll sort of disconnect you from the issue for a minute. Um, it'll get you some hydration, which is good for just keeping everything going. And that it puts you in the mindset where you can start to think. And so I sort of did, uh, did that with scotch. Just kidding. Um, <coughs> and I, I sort of, I thought, okay, don't do anything to make this even worse right now. I established that I can still boot into windows. So it's not a complete loss. It's just my videos will be very, very simple for the next little while. Um, and I just started doing my online research. I didn't throw eight hours a day at this, by the way. And I think I said that in my video. But And I <clears throat> I uh, dropped a question into a Hackintosh's Facebook group. And one of them pinged me and we sort of chatted back and forth and said, okay, I think I know. I think I know what you can do. So I... I've ordered an external hard drive case <clears throat> and when and a couple of other things and when they arrive, I will take this baby apart and, and get to work. I'm not going to film it because I feel like I'm being boring right now just talking about this stuff. This is not a computer channel, right? I'm not Linus Tech Tips or anything. Um, so I'm not going to waste the bandwidth on that. But I want this computer working again because when it is working, this is a monster machine. You know, even having saved a thousand bucks off of the same machine with an apple on it um it, it was it was still more money than i was really ready to spend anyways so that's that's that about the computer I, i'm deep diving on it because that's sort of what inspired me for tonight's subject i um i realized yes yes sorry okay so that's what i was gonna say um sort of as a knock-on effect of this i was musing this morning and realized like everyone's got a story where the shift really hit the fan while they were like a hundred clicks from home, right? Everyone's got sort of that ax fell on my foot, sliced myself while, while carving a tent peg, dropped the bacon in the fire. It's a little scrambled out for you there. Uh, Cause that guy drops bacon like it's going out of style, uh, you know, and everyone's got something like that, especially outdoors people. And it's because when you're in the outdoors, especially when you're solo, the stakes are all much, much higher, <clears throat> much, much higher. Um, oh, IRC Adventures is here. How's it going? Tenenbaum. Nice. Nice. Simon. Comment ça va, monsieur? Uh, <laughs> Grace, <laughs> that conversation between Kevin and Martin is never going to get old. Um, Tenenbaum says, yeah, exactly. Take it slow. Just stop because of what I was trying, what I was badly saying is that one mistake can build on another. If, if you don't sort of stop and think and you just, cause I used to be like that, right? Something went wrong. I would all oh, crap and just start doing stuff. Just start going. And next thing you know, something I could have salvaged is now completely destroyed. This is a, this is true with, with with computers like this. It's true on a work site. It's true in the forest. It's true on a campsite. It's true on the water. Like this is just, it's a universal, you know, it's universally true. If something goes wrong and you panic, <laughs> chances are you're going to make it worse. Um, I just want to finish saying hi to everyone. Ah, computer problems are everywhere, Simo. Hey, how's it going, Jackie? Wait, there's a retracted message already? Um, 
do not drop the bacon in the fire. It does not go over well, even so. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can't drop the bacon, man. You cannot waste that bacon. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, that doesn't sound good. Black the last Boy Scout is, is a... What did you do? So, yeah, I'm not going to speak for a full hour and bore you guys before letting people come on. I, I, I think it might be fun if someone just wants to come on, tell a story of how they really blew it one day. Um, you know, I think that would be cool. I, I, I want to hear your stories. We What's with the retracted messages, guys? Cut it out. Oh, Jack, you retracted because of a typo. All right. Do not panic. For land's sakes, don't panic. And it gets really dangerous if you panic, too. Middle of a lake, middle of the woods. Top of a waterfall, you know, I don't know. You know, with, with whiskey, one of my favorite parts is the nosing part. I'll no nose this forever before I take my first sip. You know, you, you crack a, a whiskey port in a glass, and if you just sort of like let it sit for 10 minutes, it starts to sort of develop, you know? They, they tend to hibernate a bit when they're in the bottle. I'm trying not to sneeze on you guys here. <clears throat> um, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of things going wrong. <laughs> um, but yeah, and so I, I was wondering, like, I've got a couple of, I got a couple of wicked stories about when everything sort of went wrong. Um, but I don't know if I really want to just sort of go. <laughs> Or if I want to let other people come on and just sort of we start shooting the spit. Man, I'm working so hard not to swear on, on, on screen. It's like a brown sugary caramelly thing happening on this. Um, in fact, you know, it's funny because I have two or three stories of almost losing one or another one of our daughters like not even in the woods not even doing anything the first one we almost lost as she came out of her her mom um i don't really want to tell that story I, uh, those stories sort of uh, i mean i told you guys about i learned to was to swim at like the age of whatever 30 seven or something because of Camille falling in the pool. But it's amazing how many stories you end up with like that for kids about how like, Oh man. Ooh, I'm glad that went that way and not the other way. Um, hey, hike with Mike is here. How's it going? Um, but yeah, it's funny. Hey, eh? like actually, you know, what is funny uh, when my sister had her son, <laughs> the, the doctor, uh, you know, boys will be boys and all that stupid stuff. But the doctors did say, look, if you can keep him alive until he's five, you're home free. Because <laughs> he did stuff like, you know, he, he went and put his hand right on the, the wood burning stove. And, and like when I was a boy, I did stupid things. It seems to be something about little boys. I may not even get to my beer tonight. I, I can make a dram of whiskey last like an hour. Absolutely. Uh, just to make sure I'm not... Uh... Hey, Mallory, you're in for a few minutes. <clears throat> okay, well, hold on, hold on. Mallory, if you're only in for a few minutes, then come online and tell, me, tell us all a, a story of when something went really wrong. And what you did. And then I will let you leave. I'll let you go. All right. Because uh, that I was I was gonna sort of open it up to the floor in about you know um, fifteen more minutes anyway. Give myself a half hour to just go blah 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 blah. But if you're only in for a few minutes, I want to hear a story. <clears throat> Uh, 
Uh, while we're waiting for Mallory to decide that she will, in fact, come on. <laughs> uh, haven't touched. Yeah, I'm, I'm still here. All, all must be well, right? All right. Uh, Hike, yeah, but you never come on to tell the stories. I'm sure you've got like... Yeah, I'm sure you've got some some crazy stories. Hey, you know what's funny too about when when you end up with a story like that, you don't necessarily when you're in the thick of it, you don't necessarily realize how epic something is suddenly becoming. You know, until afterwards you're like, "Wow. Whew, that was crazy." Um <clears throat> I think I've told you guys this one where my dad, my sister and I were um we used to do what we called rock hopping. It's when we, uh, it's the one where my dad, my sister, oh. and I were, um, we used to do what we, do you need to mute or do I need to mute? Oh. We, uh, there we go. Hello. Hey. Am I live? Yep. You're live. And I bet you've got a wicked story <laughs> or five. Hey, how are you? I, I'm okay. All is well. Slowly going crazy. Because of the COVID, but but I, I go crazy um, quietly. So hey, okay. how are you? I, I'm okay. All is well. Slowly going crazy because of the COVID, but I, I go crazy um, <laughs> quietly. So hey, okay. Oh gosh, I, okay. I apologize. Oh, you need headphones. That's what's going on. <laughs> sorry, I think I got it fixed uh, now. My bad. All right. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, in, in the mix of all that, uh, sorry, my audio was going crazy, but how, how are you? I'm, I'm hanging in, right? I'm hanging in. I think a lot of people are just hanging in right now. Yeah. Just marking time. Yeah. Um, I, for me, I mean, I, you're still getting out there into the woods and stuff. Uh, my headspace improved massively when I just accepted that this year's a write-off. Because I was always, like, getting really antsy about, I'm, I'm not getting out there. I'm not doing anything. I'm not. And I realized... A lot of people have to write this year off. So stop being so damn self-centered about it. Some people are in way worse. We know several people who've actually had the COVID now. Oh, really? And we're doing really, really well comparatively. So I just had to sort of, this year's a waste. Plan for the next. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. you know, you guys seem to be doing fairly well. Yeah. We, we try to pull pull something out of this year. Yeah, it, it gave us something to look forward to, but yeah, I I hear you. Uh, you gave well, you've you've given a hackintosh a try, uh, yeah. and it's put you through the loop a little bit. <laughs> well, it's funny because I'm on it right now, but the the macintosh part of it is dead, dead. So I oh, like yeah. you know I have this. I set it up to dual boot, right? Most yeah. of my hard drives are using the Mac side, and then I have a small hard drive for the for Windows as a just in case I maybe play a game or two kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of saving my butt right now uh, because <laughs> I'm I'm at least doing the live streaming. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what do you edit in? I use um, Final Cut Pro. Ah, uh, okay. Same. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think it's a much better choice than than the Adobe stuff, just because you don't have to pay oh. monthly for it. Oh. Hey, Mallory, how's Go it going? On. We're we're just yapping. Yeah, I was I was listening. I was listening. Yeah. So uh, interesting side story. I was actually an internal editor on the Final Cut Pro Ten team at Apple for a while. Uh, oh, really? And after after some of the initial, uh, or sorry, initial quirks that they uh, went through and some of the growing pains that they went through, but I came onto the team a little bit later okay. uh, and had the pleasure of working with those fine folks. Uh, and it was, it was a wild experience. Uh, but I will say that uh, Final Cut Pro 10, it's, it is a solid option now. Uh, and it's, yep. it's unfortunate that you're trying to make it work on a, on a Hackintosh, which is, which could be challenging. Unbelievably so. Um, I I sort of I keep bouncing back and forth between okay, this was an expensive mistake. Save up for a few years and get something over you know overpriced with an Apple on the back, like I used to just do. And part of me is like, no, I'm going to figure this out because I figure stuff out. Right. 
you know. Um, You're so a problem name? solver. Well, I like to think of, of myself as one, but I used to work in computers. Okay. Um, I, well, I actually work in computers again, but before I burnt out of tech the first time, <laughs> I was an interface designer and stuff. And I was like really into this. Like my, I had a, a Mac at home and I had like Linux and Mac OS and something else running on it. And I was really into this stuff. And when I burnt out, I decided to become a pedestrian user so that I could stand looking at a computer screen. And that's done me well for like 15 years now. So when I end up with a problem like this, I no longer have the, yeah, all right, you know, computer hobbyist mindset. I just think I just want it to work. Yeah. <laughs> I feel you. That, yeah. I've been yeah. spending, I just spent three hours city trying to get a 15 second clip in a vertical format in my free editing software. And I just can't get it done. I don't know what's going on. <sighs> yeah. You're using, um, you're on the windows side, right? Yeah. Mallory? Yeah. And you're using, uh, you told me once, but I forgot. It's called shortcut. It's a free editing software. Cause I, I don't want to pay for an editing software right now. Right. I'm already paying for music and paying for YouTube Red, so I don't like I don't I don't want to have another subscription. <laughs> yeah, um, there is a free editor that actually uh, um, I think is fabulous, but it has a very very steep learning curve. It's called uh, DaVinci Resolve. It's okay. pretty strong. It's pretty strong. Yeah. Yeah. It's I find it's and um, like I well. A lot of you guys know that I went to film school, uh, but back in the days when cutting and splicing was with a razor blade and tape. <laughs> so when I became a YouTuber, I started learning this generation of editing and stuff. But part of me, uh, like I have a friend who's a, a producer, I think is at, I don't know, HBO now or something. Uh, but over the years, um, I've gone down to New York and hang, hung out with him a lot and I've been at the studio and Da Vinci looks like those real pro level apps, like the sort of the ones that are aimed at a studio rather than at, 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 a, at a, like a user. But is it like a little heavier on your computer? Do you have to have like a really high performance computer to run it? I think you might. I mean, <laughs> It really depends on on like what you're putting through it. So if, if you're putting yeah. a day through it, then it's probably going to be heavier on your computer. But if you're if you're just running like say 1080p through it, it's it won't be as heavy. Okay. Which is exactly what I'm going to be dealing with now, because uh, yeah. I'm I'm going to probably edit on my 2013 laptop uh, power book for the next little while, and uh, I tried editing something that I shot recently. Like my camera these days has been this because yeah. it shoots in 4K, right? Yeah. Well, the laptop does not like 4K. Yeah. It's old and it's only got like, I don't know, not that much RAM. So it just sort of chunk. Do yeah. you really want to do this right now? And I'm like, no, okay, forgot about it. Uh, so I'm going to go back to using my DSLR shooting 1080p for now. Uh, I don't even put stuff up in 4K, right? It's just so that yeah. I could do that, that jump in thing that I like to do without losing all my uh all my resolution yeah so it's not that big a deal i can do like a single layer in 4k but as soon as i layer two two clips one on top of each other it just like completely crashes it doesn't want to do it <laughs> so you know a, a cheap and affordable way to edit 4k is actually believe it or not on an ipad because uh, you can actually put say on an ipad pro you can put uh i think you can cut or you can uh, composite up to three streams of 4K simultaneously. Wow. wow. Um, and a lot of people don't actually know that. Uh, and it's, it's actually very capable. Um, yeah. There's also Luma Fusion, uh, which you can run on, uh, on an iPad. Very capable yeah. as well. Uh, so interesting. I know, I know a number of people in the, in the YouTube world who are, who are actually on the go and it's just, it's quicker to edit on the iPad for them. Can so. you put an SD card in an iPad? So you can get like a little dongle. Uh, oh. You can connect to it. Okay. Um, so That's know. interesting. Maybe, maybe one day, maybe. Yeah. But, but then, then I'd be editing in my bed and that would just be bad. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, it's uh, surprisingly capable. The, the little Apple uh, SOC chips that they're making nowadays are, are very powerful. And they actually just came out with, look at me, I'm advertising Apple now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, oh. I'm not, not sponsored by them in any way. But and I think I know what you watched today. Yeah, they just released their brand new uh, yeah. MacBook Air and, and wow. brand new uh, MacBook Pro with uh, their own custom Apple uh, silicon chip. Their chips, own chips, they're very efficient uh, and came from our carryovers actually from the iPad and the iPhone, oh. uh, but they're they're very very capable. Yeah, they look like pretty cool machines. I just want to say hi, Johnny. Hi, Grace. Hi, everybody. Hey, Johnny. Johnny says he's got some crazy stories for us too. So maybe yeah. he'll come on a bit later. And I um, need I need to get that video and that clip in fifteen seconds in vertical. I'm trying to. Tr do this and i've been searching on the net like all day trying to figure out how to do it so i need to hop off here and, and try to figure this out guys <laughs> all right okay well if you figure it out come back on later and tell us all right yeah i, I took a little break from live streaming because i was so backed up with my editing and i was on the verge of burning out with my horses being sick and everything so that's why you haven't been seeing me lately that's all right so yeah okay speak to all you right? soon all right all right bye bye See ya. See ya. Um, but you don't hack and dust, right? No. I, uh, I was toying with the idea about a year and a half ago uh, and spent, you, you know, like a few weeks doing uh, some research on the components. And it is a shortcut to a little extra performance uh, in some regards, but... I think the compatibility issue down the road, which is something that you've you've run into, <laughs> unfortunately, is uh, is kind of a, a tricky thing to to juggle with. It like Apple could release an update, you know, tomorrow that that breaks uh, your current setup, and so anything, yeah, anything that's mission critical for me, it just I, I can't afford to play around with that, unfortunately. So yep, and that that's the same. Um... It's something that was in the back of my head anyway. And and now I really, really feel that, you know, yeah. I mean, and the thing with in the hack world, um, what I now know is you don't run an update. Yeah. You install the operating system all over again. Yeah. I, I have a friend who actually does a lot of work for, or did a lot of work for the tragically hit. Uh, and he, a very capable filmmaker. Uh, and he, was running on a Hackintosh, uh, and he just seemed to be running into issue after issue. Um, yeah. so that that was a that was a warning sign for me as well. It's just the yeah. I always tell people not to look for specs, look for results. And mm -hmm. I've actually been one of the core tenants of Apple for you know a, a really long time, uh, in the sense that a lot of people will will compare apples to pcs uh, yeah. and say you know you get more specs in a pc for less money uh, but at the end of the day apple really cares more about your user satisfaction yeah. uh, which they're incredible <clears throat> and, yeah. you know, and and the results like if you if you compare like you can crank you can render out um uh, finished video files in Final Cut Pro 10 a lot faster than you can on a higher spec PC, uh, just because it's so much more streamlined. Uh, and that's really that's really because Apple cares about results and not specs. I find that it's even faster than um, Adobe Premiere. Yeah, in a lot of regards. Yeah, like I, I have no interest in going back to Premiere, especially now that Adobe's gone to the subscription model for everything. Oh, I don't want to pay yeah. monthly for anything. Yeah. I was still subscribed to a lot of the Creative Cloud stuff up until about uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, After Effects was the last thing that I was subscribed to. Uh, but For me, it was Photoshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it's it's so yeah, you get so comfortable using some of that stuff that it's really hard to give up. What I did was um, I looked in, uh, I looked for a long time into because I research for like months before I make the jump on something. Right. So I was looking for an, uh, a Photoshop killer that was going to work slightly the way I was used to. Like I had tried GIMP, and that was clearly written by guys who are into like Linux. Yeah. I was just I didn't have the patience, you know. So I I, I bought um, Affinity 
something affinity photo and affinity design i think they were like 50 percent off um and they work kind of the way i'm used to not exactly every now and again i'm like oh, what <laughs> but generally i'm comfortable with the way it works because these guys get that it has to be photoshoppy enough if you're going to steal photoshop users great so, you uh, actually really enjoy a program called pixelmator which is what i use for that sort of stuff I actually have that. Oh, you have that. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why I went for Affinity instead. There was something in Pixelmator that was pissing me off. Yeah, there might be. <laughs> um, I, I don't remember what, but um, I don't remember what it was. But it seemed like a really capable. Oh, yeah. That one does like pixels or um, vector, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. That's that, that was a cool thing. That was why I picked it up in the first place. Yeah. And there's also uh, Pixelmator Pro as well, but like it, it yeah, it's more money. But yeah, that's yeah. I uh, I was able to between Pixelmator and uh, some of the new features in Final Cut Pro 10, I was able to finally uh, stop using After Effects. The only thing that I was really using After Effects for was for motion tracking, uh, and some of that was getting really good in in Final Cut. It, Actually, there's a brand new plugin that does a really good uh, motion tracking. Yeah, I can't afford any of the plugins, but I, man, motion tracking, I keep trying to put into my videos and then like after an hour and a half, just scrapping it because I'm, <laughs> I don't know. I may have to yeah. just throw some money at a, at a plugin. Yeah. 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 But it, I, I know what you mean. Like it's uh, sometimes some of these plugins cost more than the app. All the mm -hmm. like, so they're, they're like $200 plugins out there. They're $300 plugins, and it's just like... The whole app was 300 bucks. Yeah, yeah. God. But luckily, and, and you probably found this as well, is like I, I think I purchased Final Cut Pro 10 uh, the day it came out many, many, many years ago, uh, and I've never paid an additional... Never payments, paid, yep. yeah. Which is, which is wonderful. Which yeah. Is wonderful. Yeah. Um, did you what what application did you start in? Um, okay, I started my design life on PageMaker, mm -hmm. uh, freehand macro media. Actually, I think it was called Macro Mind freehand, Macro Media freehand. Uh, switching from that to Illustrator back in the day was a big jump. Uh, Illustrator was so much better though. I used to use InDesign. Yeah. No, well, after I sort of got past PageMaker, I was using InDesign. Um, Photoshop and Illustrator were always really big. There was, a, on the video side, my old Power Mac 8500 came with something by Avid. That, that was like a prosumer yeah. grade. Uh, don't remember what it was called. But then mm -hmm. I, I did the Adobe thing. And right. I, I just wanted to do my end program as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Right. I, I don't yeah. I don't spend that kind of money. You know. Yeah. Um and before you used uh Final Cut Pro 10, what what did you use for, for editing? Oh I, I was Adobe all the way at that point. Adobe. Okay, Adobe. Like everything I had was Adobe. Okay. Um in fact I also got um um Apple's motion. Yeah. But I don't, I don't really know what to do with it. Yeah, it's there. there's a lot of integration between uh, Motion and, and, and Final Cut. I, I think what a lot of people are using it for nowadays is to make plugins and to make custom presets in Final Cut or okay. custom behaviors. It is kind of like an After Effects uh, replacement, but um, if you think uh, the learning curve to Final Cut Pro 10 or DaVinci Resolve or any of these applications is steep, the, the one for, for motion is even steeper. Yeah, I kind of gave up on it. I was like, eh, not interested enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, like, I can do 99% of what I do in Final Cut. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, my, my biggest thing, where, where I would love a... Um, a real simple solution is in my color correction. Yep. Um, and in fact, that's gotten really weird because since I did the Hackintosh thing, I find um, even just like an iMac, the uh, Apple's color 
correct uh, color sync technology. Their color science is so good. Yeah. That on this, I've got a pretty good Samsung screen, and I've always got one of those color calibrators on the screen, trying to get it mm -hmm. to you know. And I don't think it ever really gets right. <laughs> so I'm trying to color correct, and part of me is always like, I don't think this is going to look right. So I sort of given up and decided until there are only so many issues I can deal with at once. You know, <laughs> there's just so much stuff I can deal with at once. Do with everything else and then get to color correction before because nobody is dropping crap on my videos and saying, you know, I like your editing, but come on, man. What's with the color cast, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's just giving me a free ride on that right now. So yeah, later, you know, yeah. after everything else, <laughs> after everything else, let me get a canoe first, for God's <laughs> sakes. And color correction is like one of those things that you could endlessly tweak. Yep. Uh, you could endlessly refine. Uh, so I generally get it to a, a stage at which I'm like generally happy with. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, don't go too overboard with it. Yeah. Depends on, usually depends on whether or not I'm working for a client or not. If it's for YouTube, like I'll, I'll spend a decent amount of time on it, but yeah. not, not go overboard. Yeah. Um, but I was going to say that one of the funny things about color correction is, uh, I'll often find myself uh, working on a project at like two or three in the morning, uh, like after uh, the previous night pulling an all nighter. Yeah. Uh, and at that stage, uh, my my ability to detect uh, magentas and cyans and and you know the subtle differences between shot to shot, yeah, uh, I would say goes off by about one to two percent. Yeah. <laughs> And then I'll, I'll get some sleep uh, and I'll wake up the next morning and I'll look at it again and I'll be like, oh my goodness, like I needed to, I need to bump those. <laughs> I, mean, I put in just a little too much, uh, okay. stuff in there, a little too much magenta. Uh, but uh, that, that's a lesson that I learn over and over again. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, I, I was going to say, uh, I don't want to talk too much about computers because I, I don't want to bore your audience. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is Oops. something that like i i would happily talk about for hours but uh yeah. i i'm sure some people have come for stories <laughs> yeah it's like guys what's going on here yeah i, I get that i was just wondering <laughs> if uh um you gotta have a story or two to tell yeah so i i have one um like I, I think one of my most humbling moments, uh, and some of my more humbling moments are are actually up in the mountains. Uh, and for many many years, I wanted to climb uh, Mount Washington, which is in uh, New Hampshire, mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, I think it is one of the coldest reported uh, places, in, at least in North America. I think they have a like a a weather station up there that like monitors the wind conditions and the the weather and it. I think that yeah, I think they have one of the highest wind speeds up there, and also like one of the coldest wind chills. Uh, and so for that reason alone, it's been like this uh, thing that I've sort of wanted to do yeah. uh, for many many years. Uh, it's been on my radar for like I don't know, probably like six or seven years. Uh, and when was it? And and I should say, yeah. So. A bunch of things sort of aligned uh, and made the attempt uh, possible. I wanted to climb it and then ski down it. Okay. And uh, in like the Venn diagram of what I'm really good at, we had uh, downhill skiing. Like my parents put me on downhill skis at the age of like two. Okay. Grew up with a ski racer, very comfortable, black diamonds, still black diamonds, no okay. problem, very capable. Uh, and then the other event, part of the Venn diagram was uh, I love just scrambling up mountains. So you've got these two things. And, you know, Mount Washington, that goal is sort of in the middle of it. It sits in the center there, yeah. It sits in the center, yeah. So I thought, well, this is awesome. I'm going to uh, ski tour up it, which was the one thing that I had actually never done before. Uh, I had zero experience actually ski touring. And if, if you don't know, the difference between downhill skiing and ski touring is the, the heel of the ski releases uh, so that you can actually uh, skin your way up the mountain. Okay. Uh, so it, um, the ski can crawl up the mountain and then it holds its position. 
Uh, and the heel of the ski boot allows you to pull the ski up and move forward. Sort of like on cross country skis. A little bit, yeah, a little bit yeah. like cross country skis, yeah. <clears throat> so I found uh, I found an outfitter uh, in the area. Uh, yep. Rented myself uh, some crampons uh, for the boots. Rented the um, uh, rented all the ski touring equipment. Uh, the person showed me how to use it so that I could ski back down again. Uh, did a fair amount of research on the route. Uh, and when it came to the actual day, uh, yeah. and I should mention, so this is uh, this is almost two years ago. It was like December, I think December 22nd uh, when I drove there. I drove through the night uh, and then slept in the car at three in the morning, woke up uh, at like six in the morning, three hours later. Uh, drove to the base of Mount Washington uh, and planned my ascent. Uh, the avalanche conditions were great. Uh, there was an opening in the in the window uh, when I could safely safely make it to the top. Yeah. And um, I drastically, drastically underestimated how much forward progress I could make on the ski touring skis and also how much body heat it would generate. Okay. Um, and I filmed way too much on the way up. Uh, and so it put me at Tuckerman's Ravine, uh, which is this big giant bowl that's already high up on the mountain, um, really late in the day. Uh, like, I, I think I was, I think I was in the bowl uh, around I think around three or four, uh, as the sky is starting to get quite dark, mm. um, and I'm looking up at the rest of it, uh, and the wind is just like whipping over the crest, uh, and <laughs> it's starting to get really dark. Uh, and it's it's now December. It's December. I think that day was December 23rd, okay. um, and so there's hardly anybody around because it's so close to the holidays. Um, and I can just re remember being like I completely drenched in sweat. I didn't take up enough layers, starting to freeze my butt off. Oh yeah, of course. Around, <clears throat> uh, and I'm looking up at the top, uh, and Julia was uh, due with Cedar uh, maybe two weeks later, um, and I had I had like a conversation with myself, uh, you know, like this this is starting to get kind of stupid like if i press on i'm going to get to the top in pitch dark but it's going to be freezing cold yeah um and if anything goes wrong there's very little margin for error not only that i don't actually know the ski run uh very well that comes down okay um and yeah i had to make a I had to make a judgment call so um, after driving all the way there, renting oh. all the gear, planning everything, no. yeah, I got within an hour and a half of the summit, and I just had to had to pack everything up and head back down the mountain. Um, and I, in hindsight, I was so thankful that I did uh, because the ski, the designated ski trail that goes down, even from where I was, mm -hmm. was. Pretty much, it was a different area of the hill than I'd hiked up, uh, and it was pretty much all boilerplate ice. Oh. Uh, and I had three hard falls on the way down, really injured one of my wrists, uh, damaged some of my filming equipment, um, and came down in the dark, uh, ski down in the dark. And um, yeah, it, it was the right decision. Uh, yeah. But but it's also tough when you're only on three hours of sleep, right? Yeah. I mean, when you do something like that, is it really is best to be sort of at your sharpest. But I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have some stories kind of like that. You know, the first time that I, I was about to use her name, the first time that uh, the missus and I um, got on snowshoes. Um, so whatever, decade and a half ago or something, uh, like we were like we're going to buy these snowshoes and we bought snowshoes <clears throat> and we went to this, um, whatever the hell that shit is, uh, a, a bed and breakfast out in, uh, in the countryside and it's on a mountain and there were, um, pists, uh, trails 
So we looked at a map, <clears throat> easy trail. We've never done this before. Sweet. Turns off to something that goes all the way up to the, the mountain and comes back down. We're like, okay, it's whatever, one. Easy trail, easy little loop. <clears throat> Except that at some point we we did a, a, a wrong turn and went all the way up the freaking mountain. Like we were climbing and we had we had bought the, the snowshoes with the, the thing, you know, that you can turn the back into a step so you can go up. Yeah. Thank the gods. So like, no problem. It says that it's got a light ascent. Well, crumbs. <laughs> Next thing you know, okay, we're finally at the top of the of the, the hard air thing, and the sun's going down, much like what you're talking about. I'm like, how though? This is an easy route. <laughs> <clears throat> and we're looking at the map and doing and putting two and two together and saying, we don't have time to get home. So let's just go because we were just going to sit and, you know, we had a thermos of, uh, of tea or whatever. We just sort of looked at each other and said, we got to get down like Lola. <laughs> so we just turned and just went and just, just, just went and followed the, you know, the route looking at the, uh, those things on the trees. But the thing is, there weren't a lot of those little symbols anywhere. So like, we didn't remember seeing, you know, this way is easy. This way is, is <laughs> whatever medium or you know intermediate or anything like that so we got home and it was it was home we got back down but it was dark we we're using like flashlights to see where we were going and thinking well that was smart <laughs> you know but i mean we did get down uh, i feel that the chance for injuring yourself on snowshoes is very different though than downhill skiing because on snowshoes you have to sort of step wrong twist your foot or step off a ledge <laughs> you know whereas skiing and and like snowboarding and stuff uh, always seems like you have way more opportunity for fun shall we say yeah <laughs> you know i just but yeah it's funny i wonder if i wonder if, if everyone has that kind of story dead of winter gonna take this trail oh my god it's getting dark and i'm scared shitless yeah <laughs> So were were you like reasonably prepared? Did you have uh, like first aid kits or? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But at that point, I had first aid kits, but I hadn't practiced with all the stuff. Right. You know, you buy two of a first aid kit, right? One, you just assume you're going to blow through it, <laughs> learning to use everything. Um. But you know, we. we I'm not a prepper, right? Do you know what I'm saying? So like the stuff yeah. I bring is always going to be sort of the minimum that I feel I can get away with so that I'm, I don't have like bags and bags on my belt. You know, I'm not wearing like camo and a, and a sniper suit or anything like that. <laughs> you know, I mean, I go as light as I can. <clears throat> um, But yeah, yeah, we got down and, you know, to us, it's a funny story now, but all of these funny stories could end very, very badly, you know? As, uh... Yeah, I, I think both our stories really, um, they remind me of something that uh, Julie and I have learned uh, a number of times in the, the triathlon community, which is you don't try anything new on race day uh, right. when it's mission critical. So like, for instance, like you're not trying new goggles on race day, you're not trying new um tire pressures on race day, you're not trying right. to do anything on race day. And there could be hundreds of things that you can take into consideration on race day. Right. Uh, because when it, when it really matters and something goes wrong, uh, that's uh, such a terrible time uh, for yep. it to go wrong. Uh, and I think in hindsight, like I, I, I really should have tried ski touring uh, skis uh, somewhere else on like just the top. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised that you, that you, try them the first time in that kind of situation yeah yeah and in hindsight it it, it felt um really stupid <laughs> <laughs> well that's the magic of hindsight though right yeah, yeah it's the same as when you're in that situation like okay i'm an hour and a half from the top do i just say let's just do it or do i turn around now because some people say look i came really far i just got to do it you know yeah um, yeah I, I have a friend who um, uh, he was at a, a big American university at the time. Now he's uh, 
a professor at a Canadian university, but uh, one of the professors in his department every year took um, a select few of the students on a ski trip. Mm -hmm. And he was that type who's, who's just like, let's just do it. And um, unfortunately, the group got lost this time. And mm -hmm. uh, like somebody's ski broke and the weather had turned much, much rougher than they were expecting. And the nobody died, uh, but a couple of people lost some toes, and you wow. know, so, someone fell through the snow into like um, into a, a stream underneath, and ended up like with his boot encased in ice, and it was just a very, very bad situation. And the, 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 this teacher wasn't equipped up here, I mean, to deal with this kind of stuff. Because right. he was like, no, we're going to get to the next cabin. Because they were sleeping like there were these cabins every however many miles, because it was in the States. And it's just like when uh, when he was telling me this story, when the, he got back and was okay, I was just like filled with this rage at this professor who would bring these kids out without being like a, a safety sally about it, to use a term that I keep hearing and kind of hate. But you, you know what I'm saying, right? Like if you're taking these kids out, because these kids are like 18 to 22, right? Yeah. 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 It's, it's, yeah. Different. it's different when it's yourself. Um, yeah. When, you're, when there are other people in the party. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Party who aren't as experienced. Yeah, you can't make... You can't make assumptions about their experience. And, and, and he did, right? Some of these kids shouldn't have been on that. Shouldn't have been there. You know, because some of them didn't have the kind of experience. I'm just going to share the uh, the link out again if anyone wants to uh, come on and tell us some stories too. So, in that situation, uh, when you're um, out snowshoeing, how did you actually react to the to the moment where you you came to terms with turning around or or getting back down the mountain or getting back home? For me, it's funny because you know some people when they realize that the stuff might hit the fan. They get really like, it's a sudden boom. I got to do something. <clears throat> I'm very much of a slow burn type. Okay. I get up and I'm like, okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, like I, I don't, I, I never like, like if I'm trying to do something and some suddenly someone starts yelling at me, I get really stressed and I, I start to, you know, yeah. but I'm, I'm a real slow burner on that kind of stuff. So I'm like, okay, honey, I think this is what's happened. Do you think? Yeah, let's take a look. Okay. But at that point, like when it's coming, when it's getting dark and we're like, what the, maybe we're not good enough for this. If this is the easy and uh, like we sort of looked and realized, okay, well, the thing is we're halfway there. If we turn around and go back, it's the same distance. If our sort of mental math was, was right. Or if we go forward, it's also the same distance. But here's the thing. It's getting dark, and we don't know that part of the loop. Whereas if we turn around, we kind of know what we came up. So that's what we did. We turned around. So that at least while we're fighting through the dark, we had we had already, like, we could see our prints. Yeah. So the, the, the chance of getting lost was much, much slimmer. Hey, Johnny. Um, how are you? We're good. Uh, do you guys know each other? I Hello. no. No. How are you? I'm Johnny. Hi, Johnny. Nice to meet you. Cool. Yeah. Nice to meet you. I uh, tear my phone here. I just unboxed a really cool mount for my phone, so that I could uh, have it sit up like this, and also um, I'd be able to hook it to my bike and uh, my motorcycle. So that way, when I'm doing lives and stuff, like take everyone along. You know what I mean? So I'm having fun. I'm doing an unboxing. Right now, I got all this mail today. It's like Christmas. <laughs> Been doing that, and I was right in the middle. I'm in my overalls, getting ready to go and do some tree trimming and some lawn work. So busy day for me. But yeah, Chris, Chris jo Johnny is. Uh, he's got this wicked huge garden. He's got like he's Mr. Uh -huh. Green Thumbs. Nice. Uh, yeah. all the inside stuff done, and the kids are fed. So that's the cool thing about. What, uh, what are you unboxing? Um, you know, it's funny because the thing is with me, I order a bunch of stuff that I know I need and then I'm working on in projects and then I forget what they are before they come in. 
So that <laughs> part is when I put it as, oh, wow, there it is. You know, like this one, it has a picture on the package. So this one is a multiple USB port charger. Oh, nice. So, yeah, what I'm using this for is right now is I run all my lights in my house at night. There are these solar batteries. So I run them off a small bank that I built. And um, I needed a charger that was a little bit bigger to run off my bank so that I could charge uh, smaller appliances that my kids use because they're doing uh, Zoom meetings and homeschool. Yep. So they can only shoot us these uh, laptops. And they've been using those. And what I'm going to do is run them from the bank and charge them by the sun. And nice. Our lights, we're going to rock all the kids' small devices. They have earbuds, too, and they're like, YouTube junkies like me, you know what I mean? I guess it's going to take you wind up hooked on YouTube all the time. <laughs> that That's never happened to anyone. Yeah, right? I, I don't know. I'm, just, I'm probably preaching the choir on that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, Johnny, before we get to your story, I wanted to say two things. First, up yeah. north of 60s here. It's always a better night when he shows up. How's it going, mister? <laughs> uh, we're, we're talking about uh, big oopsies we've had either on a job site or out in the woods. Um, and I did want to mention, <clears throat> uh, Chris, I used to be a very avid mountain biker. Really? Uh, avid, avid mountain biker. Oh, God, I'm hilarious. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, I got my wife into it and stuff, and we used to do a lot of biking. And one um, one time I was cruising down, uh, more like a trail rider than like a big hit kind of downhiller. Yeah. Um. And here's the funny thing. I was always more terrified of the um, the um, um, the Montpont. Oh, the words tonight. Uh, the, the the thing where you sit on to go up the mountain. Oh, the, the, the lift. lift. Yeah, chairlift. Yeah. The chairlift, yeah. yeah. I was always way more scared of that than coming <laughs> down the mountain because um, I have a debilitating fear of heights. Mm -hmm. And... After, you know, at that point, two and a half decades of being in art school, starting as a kid at the uh, National or the Provincial Gallery in Manitoba to like, I went to a fine art school as a kid and then design school and then film school. Like to me, it's all visual, right? And so going up the, the mountainside, I would just be like, I would just be dying because in my head, I could visualize myself and whoever's sitting next to me, just, whew, yeah, I could, just, I could see it happening, you know? I, uh. Yeah. I used uh, that uh, that exact same fear, Jesse. And then uh, what had happened is uh, some friends forced me to go skydiving with them. Yeah, no, and, uh, no. Uh, and after after I did that, and and get this, I had a hole in my shoe. So we were coming down, oh. but the shoe popped. Man, we're all sideways, and like you know, I was running tandem, so I had the instructor strapped to me, right? Well, I was strapped to him, and I was like, "What's going on?" He's all, "Don't worry, I got this handled." And I'm like, you know, like. Like flipping out, and, and then fly in because I dove with a bunch of friends, and we flow in together, and we're like we're air dropping. Yeah. And then uh, I hear him say, "Hey, did you see that?" And the other guy's like, "Man, that's intense." And I'm like, "What? What's intense?" And he's like, "You see all those tension knots in my line?" He's all, "Man, there's something wrong." And I'm all like freaking out, like almost going like into shock. And then we make it down and run it off. We run the thirty feet, you know, until the chute drops. I said, oh, there's a problem. There's about a foot hole in our chute. And I'm like, I grabbed, <laughs> I grabbed him and kissed him on the face. And then $20 bill. I'm like, here's your tip. I'm like, thank you for not letting us die. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Yeah. That's worse than the story I was about to tell. Oh, my goodness. That, that's... Oh, dude. <laughs> Yikes. Because what I was going to say is that mine was a very typical story that I'm, I'm halfway down the mountain. Um, I come into sort of, uh, it's a, I was in a technical area and then it sort of comes into an, uh, an easy kind of curve, but one that's all like, um, you guys know what baby heads are? No. They're, they're rocks about the size of a baby's head. Okay. So it's a field of those. So I'm, I know how to handle these, right? You sort of lean off the back so that you don't put all your weight on the front just in case. You don't roll over the handlebars. You don't go over there because if uh, anyway, <laughs> I don't know what the hell, man. But I just I took one wrong, and just I went down so hard and I slid, 
And I was wearing, I always wore um, their knee pads, but they're also shin pads. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, I a couple of rocks or something I had either pushed this thing aside or pushed up right under, but I was scratched to hell. Wait, let me put this back together. No, the um, the sprocket, the big, the the chain ring, the big one, had yeah. pushed it aside, and I was and had sort of gone into my shin and was and scratched the bone. Ooh. Uh, which, by the way, <laughs> I don't know if either of you have ever felt that, but I cannot recommend it. And it makes a weird sound too. And I tell you what, oh, you've got an energizer bunny. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, yeah. At it. It's like a whole thing. When I was growing up, I got one of these for him, uh, and I had been separated from my family. So okay. I actually have to wrap this up as a Christmas gift for him. It's the uh, nice. Energizer Bunny. Like he really liked the old uh, '90s commercials. Yeah. yeah. I forget this. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, anyways, I, I had to walk down the rest of the mountain carrying my bike, bleeding <laughs> like you would not believe. And then when I got home that night, my uh, the missus. Took a look. Well, actually, first uh, I met the guys who I was there with. We drove um, one of them home, stopped off at <laughs> at my friend's place, and his wife said, you guys broke Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> and he took me home, and she had called my wife, I guess. So when we pulled in, I'm feeling kind of woozy because I'm very squeamish, and I felt something scratching on my, my bone, and I was bleeding a lot. Um, you didn't do hospital? I should have, but I went home and my wife was like, <laughs> couch, I don't care what you watch, but don't look. And and she had like hydrogen peroxide and alcohol and Q-tips and all this stuff. And so I just sort of sat there and tried. And she put a pillow here, said, don't look. Really? And so she fixed me up. It hurt like hell. Yeah. Um, Did you? She and I, I mean, I've still got scars. It still looks terrible. I mean, it's not like they were huge gashes. Did she they were just you? very deep and really gross. And yeah. she was like picking rocks out. And I was just like, yeah, because I'm squeamish. Right. So, you know, when you're doing this kind of thing, like, I'm not going to look, I'm not going to look, I'm not going to look. I'm, I'm going to sing to myself anything just to not. Uh. Did she uh, did she sew it up? No, no, no? she just she just closed it up. Real tight, uh, and on some butterflies. super glue or something, or yeah, something like that. I don't remember. Okay. I, I really, yeah. and up until then, I had been fairly lucky um, on the mountain. I had had one wicked wipeout on gravel at one point, it's kind of the same, just uneasy. And I was going, and the next thing you know, my bike was doing this, and I was running next to it. I was like, How the hell did this happen? But uh, yeah, that was my only time really getting hurt on on the mountain i i hurt myself i broke my hand here and here um, on a bike path on my way to work one morning oh jeez. um just and this is an interesting story because i think i really went about this one wrong because everything went went south and i did not do the right thing i'm coming along it's raining um and i'm on the bike path there's this thing called the lachine canal okay um which I used to live on one side of, and I worked on the other side. This is a long time ago. So I worked at a Starbucks and I would bike. It was like, whatever, eight clicks or something every morning. And I, I was uh, what they called a shift lead. So I had to go and open the store at seven. So I had to be there early. Anyways, I'm beaten along. And every now and again, there's like a little wooden bridge that crosses a, a small tributary of, of the canal. Mm -hmm. And when it's raining, when, when these bridges are wet they're like slick as snot okay yeah. um so it's a rainy day and i'm booting because i don't want to be late and so it, it curves little bridge curves and goes and so i always sort of do like in a car right you slow down before the curve and then you sort of maintain your speed or speed up slightly going through it mm -hmm. i'm doing it by the book and i come around and this girl on like some clunker hybrid comes around towards me and like she's coming directly at me and like our eyes click and i'm expecting her to move over so you know and i move over no way she's just coming uh and it's not that long a bridge and so i wipe out bike goes skittering right at the rail and i'm like please don't go into the drink and it fortunately does not it bounces back and hits me in the knee uh but what happened was as i went down i'm holding on to the handlebars hmm, 
Mm, okay. I'm holding onto the handlebars and like there's some pressure thing like this. At least this is what the doctor thinks. There's a pressure thing like that which snaps me here and here as I go down. Mm. Anyway, so I, I slide. She doesn't even stop, eh? She she saw me go down. I mean, she watched me go. She heard the thump, saw the bike skitter, saw, saw me get it right back in the knee. It's difficult. <laughs> and just kept on going. Didn't even, so, so I get up and I'm like, oh wow, that was that was really painful. And I get on the bike and I'm riding to work. And I'm like, this doesn't feel right. Um, but I go to work and I'm doing my shift and I'm on the, the the espresso maker. And my boss takes a look and my hand goes is going like this, right? He says, You know what? Take the rest of the day. And why don't you go and get that looked at? So I <laughs> got on my bike and rode home. <laughs> By the time I get home, my wife is home from, uh, I think she was she was working at a different Starbucks at the time or something, you know? And uh, so I, I come in. She's like, no, me no, 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 hospital, go. <laughs> so I went to the hospital and they put a, the guy looked at it. And the doctor said, well, I'm impressed. I've never, I have rarely seen that many, you know, that kind of break on the same hand. So uh, I'm going to remember you. <laughs> Yeah. Nice. He put a he put a, <laughs> the the cast on and everything, but it was so painful. And I should why did I go to work? You know, Jesse, it's a it's a work thing. I mean, it's a camaraderie type thing. I mean, you always show up to your shift. You always, always did get sent home. I'm one of those guys that never calls in sick. Like, yeah. like, man, I've I've gone in like dead, and then like I had my managers and my chefs who were like. <laughs> get the hell out of here, man. What are you doing? Yeah. Like, uh, like, like I've gone and dying, man. You know, that's, that's just how it is, man. Part of being a soldier. And that's what you're doing. Yeah. Like, man. And, and, and thank God you healed, right. You healed, right. That's the thing. That's the major concern. Like you tell me this little story is like, like, I'm like, why do you yeah. go right in, go right to the hospital? I mean, especially for a hand, like, uh, you know, like, and, and there's no reason for me not to, right. Like I'm not yeah. gonna get a bill. Oh yeah. my goodness. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like when I was a kid, I uh I think I was like sixteen and I had a job as a server at a jazz bar. And I was hanging out with some friends right before I went in and we were shooting BB guns. Uh one of the pistols jammed up, okay? Yeah. It jammed up and me idiot. I didn't pull the revolver out. You know, I didn't pull the clip. So okay. I put a point blank to my hand and went pa. And shot. I'm like, oh, okay, we're good. I go back to shooting, and then two of my friends are like, "Man, Johnny, uh, you're bleeding, dude." And I'm like, "What? Where?" And they're like, "It's dripping down your elbow." And then I'm like, "Whoa!" And then go and roll. And uh, I'm like, "Well, I got to go to work in like 40 minutes, man. I squeeze this out." So I went up to the bathroom and I start trying to squeeze it out. All the roommates are just like screaming, screaming. Okay. I was living with a girlfriend at the time. I had her mom come in and I hand her a set of pliers and I'll pull it out. And she tried and she's like digging in the sink and there's just like blood everywhere. Everyone's screaming. And, and then, you know, they're like, that's it. You got to go to the hospital. And then what happened is the, I'm, I'm in Hawaii. So there's no surgeons or anything out here. They had to fly someone in. So they wow. sat, they sat me in a room waiting for the surgeon to show up. And then they sedated me. But the pellet from where it hit had gotten into the bloodstream because it hit, oh. stopped at the bone. Okay. It, 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 it started to flow up into okay. the bloodstream. And then, okay. and then so they actually had to cut my whole hand open instead of just pouring. because that was, so that was, that was it. That wasn't fun. Remember what I was saying before about how when the uh, crap hits the fan and if you start going without stopping to think, you might create a larger problem? Yeah. yeah, Johnny, I'm just. Yeah. yeah. Now I know. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. You know, if I would have, and just like like what you said, you know, like what everyone says, if I uh, if I would have known then, but then I would have missed out on all that great life experience. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Colin Colin has an interesting story here. The worst I have ever had was when I had a fishbone pierce my boot and got deep in my foot, which had to be surgically removed. Uh -huh. I didn't know fish bones were that strong. Wow. No, no, Jesse, I actually had the exact same thing happen, except I didn't have to have it uh, surgically removed. So, you know, catfish, catfish, horse, oh. bike. 
at, uh, I was like seven years old, catfishing with my cousins from Vietnam, and I karate kicked a catfish. <laughs> it threw the shoe. Yeah. And it, and it broke off. And uh, and we were out there, and they had to uh, pull it out and rinse my foot off in the uh, river. Yeah. It was excruciating. It was gnarly, and it, uh, it didn't stop hurting for like, man, I think it was about two weeks, if I remember correctly. Man, I like was at school, man. I was like doing gym and I we had to play soccer that week and it was terrible. Like <laughs> but Johnny, you karate kicked a fish. No, man, I know, man. Right as kid, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh Jesse, I, I actually have a, a story that's very similar to yours. Uh so like as triathletes, we do a, a ton of road cycling. Uh and we were going out for a training ride uh, one day. And uh, we we're just getting started with the ride. And it's it's a little cooler, so I'm wearing like tights uh, that mm-hmm. go all the way down the leg. Yeah. And we we were getting out to the road and I made a, a sharp bend around on a, on a sidewalk just to get out to the road. And I, I made a really tight bend uh, and something caught my pedal. I ended up going over the handlebars uh, and fell down my, my shoe unclipped and my knee um uh was sliced by the front chain ring yeah chain ring just gets incredibly sharp yeah and working. dirty yeah really dirty uh and it cut right through the tights uh about a better th- um, i want to say about an inch and a half uh long gash yeah the funny thing is at the time the cut was so clean uh that I didn't really notice it that much in the oh. in the in the flinging motion of it all. Like it, yeah. I was kind of shocked and surprised, so I didn't really notice it. And I looked down at my tights, and of course, like the the gash through the tight had moved, like slid up my leg. It was just oh, so you didn't notice? Yeah, yeah, you didn't notice it. So then we go out and we do a sixty-kilometer-long ride, and we get back and I look down at my leg again and there's blood oozing out of the tights. Yeah. I ended up taking them off. I looked down at my, my leg and I've got, sure enough, I've got like a, like an inch and a half long gown just below my knee. Yeah. Um, it's also, it's also maybe I want to say maybe like half an inch, well, verging on half an inch deep yeah. and well, maybe closer to a quarter of an inch deep. Um, but it had been gradually torn apart. Oh, wide. No, I, I think what happened. I think what happened was the the endorphins that were going <laughs> from the ride itself, and having mentally not seen it, yeah, um, sort of masked all the pain, uh, and then I, just the world of hurt uh, yeah. as soon as I saw and noticed it, and the endorphins from the workout began to to evaporate, so to speak. Yeah. And I called my mom, who's a really experienced nurse, uh, and she's like, "Yeah, you're you're well beyond the window of opportunity for for stitches now. Yeah, you're yeah. really just gonna have to like, you have to try to pull it together with like, you know, whatever you can, like Duct tape. tape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's tape, and that's that's more or less what I did. Oh, Jesse, you're you're right. And in some cases, I mean, I've done it. I've done it. You know what I mean? I've done some stupid. Stuff. That doesn't surprise me, Johnny. I'm, the more <laughs> stories I hear from you, the more I'm like. <laughs> How are you alive? Man, I I done some real stupid stuff, and then this little ditty right here, this right. one, that cost me uh, geez, it cost me uh, thirty two inside and seventy two on the out, you know, and that wow. was back, back in college, and I I tried to have a friend, sew that up after I had tried myself, so I tried to sew myself up yeah. with a needle, I took the needle, and pushed it so hard that it went through my thumb. And it oh. hit, hit the nail, screaming. There was blood everywhere. Johnny, and uh, when this shit hits the fan, stop and think. It's like, hey man, I was in the heat of the moment, like she said. My endorphins were. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and, I feel and, nauseous. It was gnarly, gnarly man. It was, it was ugly. It was ugly, man. There was blood. Yeah. In it. Like. <laughs> Man, and and you know, I'll never try and do that again. I realized after watching myself get sewn up after, yeah, man, curve needles are how they do it. Yeah, <laughs> it was like, <laughs> 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 I 
Uh. <laughs> hey, man, you you want to be dumb, you got to be tough. I didn't say I wanted to be dumb. Yeah, I, I'm pretty tough. I'm I'm pretty <laughs> tough. Uh, you know. By the way, Chris, you do uh you do Iron Man, don't you? Yeah, Iron Man fries. Yeah. Uh, have you ever done the one in Penticton? You're, you're breaking up a little bit. No. I'm not breaking up. Johnny's breaking up. <laughs> I haven't done the one in Penticton. I've done mm -hmm. the uh, the one. I've done uh, the Iron Man Mont Tremblant twice, the full twice, and mm -hmm. the half twice. Um, oh. Oh. Lots, of, lots of hill climbing. I got the Bogard yeah. calling. My uh, my dad lives in well. My dad and his wife live in Penticton, and they used to have oh, a, a short term yeah. rental house. My and sister so, and brother in law live in Penticton. We were actually just there last summer. But sorry, yeah, uh, yeah. They uh, they they used to own a, a little short term rental, and every uh, every Ironman, there were like a couple of athletes who would like I guess take turns or whatever. Like they had some repeat um, renters, and whatever. And my dad and I are both really into bikes. Yeah. So every time Iron Man came through, he'd be like down there looking at all the, looking at you know the Cervelo and all that stuff. You know. I, I have a Cervelo. Yeah. Um, my my sister who I had on um for an interview several episodes ago, she also has a Cervelo. Um, she does a lot of a lot of distance biking and stuff with the uh, the Wounded Warriors. Uh, nice bikes. Definitely too rich for my blood. Yeah. But, it, well, you can get like. My my Cervelo isn't crazy expensive. Like I, uh, I have a, a a PQC, which is a, like a time trial bike that's carbon frame. Uh, but I think when I got it, it was around like two two and a half grand, and then uh, with some nice wheels on it. Uh, but there are people out there who are spending anywhere from ten to fifteen thousand dollars on a road yeah. bike. Yeah. Which yeah. Like, <clears throat> if you're rolling like custom suspension and stuff like that, depending on what you want to do, yeah. which is interesting because when this whole uh, thing started happening, you couldn't, you can't get a bike out here. Like first thing I wanted to do was go and grab me a mountain bike. Right. I had to order online and it was hard. It's, it gets really complicated and hard to choose a bike that you might right. work for you in your environment and what you intend to do with it. Because there's yeah, so you got to try it out different choices. Well, I didn't get to Jesse. So what I did is I was looking at a few, and it's kind of a hybrid bike. I'll show you right now. But I went, and I got myself a Linus. Have you heard of Linus? No. No. So here's my bike. Wait, let me see the logo. It's right here. Yes, I recognize that logo. I've only ever seen, like, one or two of them. Yeah. And, and they were, like, outside of a, an espresso place. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. yeah. These, uh, this one right here is kind of like a, uh, a road trail hybrid okay it's got a black a back fender on it right um no no it does no? not okay because the one i saw had like a big old fender off the back really yeah you know uh, my wife that one she got the dutchy which is a dutch bike yeah this one is is like i said it's more of a hybrid it's got nine gears okay. and it's bare bones like yeah you can see how the frame is it's curved a little bit kind of like a cruiser yeah yeah and then i got my lights and my my gearing set up so yeah like i said it's nine and then it's full disc brake but yeah and then i got the um the aluminum alloy um pedals on here yeah uh it's interesting that there are discs on that i on my da vinci uh chris i think i told you about my da vinci over instagram yeah. at one point da vinci makes great bikes. oh yeah yeah um they they when they started making the Bixies, I, I think that they kind of overloaded themselves a bit. Um, yeah. But uh, they, they seem to have gotten their, their mojo back. But um, my Da Vinci was a cross-country race bike, so obviously it came with the um, the V-brakes, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> because discs are so much heavier and, you know, weight weenies and all that stuff. <laughs> um, but I switched it up to discs uh, after I was riding again in the rain and slid under a van. <laughs> Oh, God. because the the, yeah. the wheels were so wet that these little i was like wailing on the brakes right <laughs> just i'm not stopping i'm not <laughs> stopping and i cracked my head on the side of the van and went <laughs> right under you got the worst bug man guy because i what are you doing i said I, i'm dying for crying out loud let me do it in peace uh, <laughs> thank god he was he had a sense of humor because just breaks yeah yeah 
I, I never, I've never biffed on a, on a bicycle or my dirt bike. Um, I spilt my moped once because the same reason you did. The ground was wet from sprinklers, and I knew I was going. I had my earbuds in. I was rocking out. I was going like about 30. And what I did is that when I knew it happened, I already Wait, you were going me. about 30? Yeah. I, miles. Yeah, 30 miles per hour. And, okay. And I thought, you know, like when I hit the corner, I'm like, I knew when it was going to happen because I could feel it going out the back end. So I put my foot, I raised myself up, put my foot on the seat and kicked yeah. the, I kicked the bike and it went like 15 yards that way. And I stayed there and then I landed on my backpack. Is that a backpack on? Mm. And there was a bunch of cars that stopped to look at me and they're like, man, are you all right? And I got up and was laughing and they're like, F you, you know what I mean? It's not funny. It's not a joke. I'm like, dude, I'm laughing that I'm alive. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Laughter of relief. Not of, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. The bike still running, the wheels just still going, and I'm just like, Man. "Oh right, this is the moped." Okay, I thought you were saying that you were on like a bike. No, I was right? on a moped. Yeah, I'm on a thirty, moped. and I was like, "Dude." And I'm like, "Oh, dude, I got thirty on my up gear off a of Holly Akala biking down the mountain, man, and that's intense. That's scary, scary. Yeah. Like, man, you get to that speed, and you're like, you know, any wrong move I make right now is gonna cost me probably a collarbone. You know what I mean?" <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's an equation that has to happen inside your head when you're in that moment. Oh, it's been a do I do I, I spend even, the collarbone? <laughs> I don't even, I don't even actually like when I'm in the moment. I don't even actually think it's just like uh it's full adrenaline and uh I see things coming like a mile away and I'm just immediate reaction without even thinking. It's like second nature. It's like you know, but once you know, and that's just like. I don't know. Some people don't have that, man. I'm lucky. I'm lucky because I've been skateboarding my whole life too. So like, like when I go to go hit a set of stairs or try and bust, like, like before I don't do it anymore, like a set of handrails or like I do something that's uh, a little bit gnarly. And I know I'm probably going to like roll. Like I broke my ribs because I landed. There's a certain way to land and roll it off. And I uh, landed once right on my elbow and it, Oh, I bruised my ribs doing that once. I wasn't even doing anything crazy. I was going down a hill on foot, but it was a steep hill, and I had a big-ass backpack on, and I started to pick up speed. and was like, hey, this ain't going to go right. And then I tripped and fell right on my elbows. Boom. And I kind of heard a click. I, uh, and I was like, whew. I, I rolled everything off. hurts. I uh, missed the set. I, I made the stairs. I just didn't land it right. So my board went and shot. And yeah. then I, and when I rolled, instead of rolling like I should have, like this, yeah, it caught me and it broke three ribs. Oh, oh. yeah, that that's that's got a sting. <laughs> oh, man, it was like I couldn't sleep that side for a month and a half, and then like, you know, every time I coughed, it hurt like excruciatingly. Like, yeah, so, oh no, here's a here comes a sneeze, and it's just like, <laughs> like, like, like getting the wind knocked out of you, like literally getting yeah. the wind. Yeah, it's just terrible, man. It was it was a horrible time. And there's I, I know what you mean, Johnny though, about like there's a way there's a way to fall. Uh there's a there's a way to, to handle it. Like if, yeah. if anything, ski racing taught me how to dissipate energy. Like if you if you have to bail at 115 kilometers per hour, like you you have to dissipate the energy as yeah, safely yeah. as you can. And you just kind yeah. of ragdoll. And let the energy dissipate any way it wants to go, rather than take it at hard. Like you don't want to, you don't want to yeah. hit the ground um, tense. You want to hit the ground. And you want to hit the ground easy. Yeah. You have to diffuse, diffuse the momentum. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it, it's it's a school of hard knocks, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I ski racing. I hit the ground really hard, really fast, many many times. Um, yeah, if if you do anything like this, mountain biking or or anything like like what Chris is talking about, <clears throat> you're gonna end up with some scars. Oh yeah, you know? lots of yeah. road rash. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, there are two types of people who do this kind of stuff: those who have gone down hard and those who will go down hard. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like owning a motorcycle. I paid my dues good. <laughs> Okay, but Johnny, here's an interesting question for you. And Chris, you, you might have some thoughts too. Johnny, you got squirts, right? He's drinking beer. Squirts. Yeah. Youngins. Kids. Yeah, Replacement course. people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you find that you are a whole lot less crazy than you were before you had those kids? 
Not really. Really? Because for me, holy crap, man, it changed everything. It uh, just changed everything. Yeah. You know? it, get me wrong. It, it did uh, change the way I look at everything, like in mm -hmm. life, everything else. And then um, the way I take certain risks. But once I uh, get back on my skateboard, or if I'm like riding, mm -hmm. like it's all gone. Everything falls away. It's like I get in a zone. It's like, okay, I'm going from here to here. I'm making that jump, that jump, and that jump, and then I'm busting these tricks. And that's all I'm thinking about. I don't think about anything once I once I'm engaged, should we say. Mm -hmm. Once I'm engaged on on what I'm doing, right. It dissolves away and I'm like, I got like it's dead reckoning, should I say. It's like point A, point B. I'm going there. And I'm dead going reckoning. That, yeah, it's point A, point B where i'm going and that's where i'm gonna be no matter what okay. uh, i just like it everything goes away like i don't know it's weird it's weird don't get me wrong like it does uh change it has changed my decision making and um uh, my life decisions and it's changed my entire life honestly but uh but once i get on something like if i'm on a bike or a skateboard there's no thoughts at all i, I go into, like zen mode right like, like i said dead reckoning point a point d i'm going there like and that's it. Like, so, um, I I haven't been to the mountain like on a bike since Camille was born nine years ago. And that's not because oh I'm not doing that anymore. It's well maybe I'm not doing that anymore. But it's we just we don't have time anymore. And I don't miss it as much as I thought I would. Yeah. Um, time, is, time is but, definitely a thing, man. That to take into account because we don't have the time that we used to do because we're investing our time in other things. Well, uh, yeah, and and uh, that has really changed. Like, I do a whole lot more hiking because I can bring the kids with me and stuff. And I would like, actually, Chris, maybe we can talk about this later, but I would love to do a, a panel discussion about hating the great outdoors with young kids. Because I think um, Cedar's about the same age as our younger daughter, Clemence. She was born, she'll be two years old the 28th of December. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, they they have the same. Uh, sorry, no cedar. Yeah, no, they have the same birthday. Are yeah. you the same birthday? Oh, really? Okay, <laughs> yeah. so they're the same age, and I know that cedar sometimes goes out with you guys because yeah. I'm. I think I've seen pictures of, and you know, Clem comes out. You know, I put her on that. The, you know, those backpacky things. You just stick the baby in. Yeah. And they scream yeah. until they get used to it, and then you just go. Yeah. Um, uh, and like <clears throat> a lot of how her older sister and I bonded was, you know, teaching her to, to light fires with a ferro rod, um, hiking, camping, stuff like that. Yeah. And um, I like I've people who've been following me forever. I, I'll mention the book again. Sorry guys. But um, because I read last, last child in the woods, uh, which was a book about how, you know, the kids are having the, the, the nature taken away from them. like in some uh, neighborhoods in places like Toronto, there are parks where you're not allowed to climb the trees anymore. I'm yeah. saying Toronto because I was literally called out in the book. Um, you know, in Quebec, we're a little more laissez faire about stuff like that, but we have all kinds of stuff like that as well. You know, you, you can change the geography, but no matter where you look, kids are being blocked from, hitting the natural world and i you know when i was a kid you know my mom would say go out come back for supper yeah, yeah. right and and we would play in the woods along the train tracks and all this kind of stuff and so i i want to do a, a panel discussion about people who get their kids into the boat or into the woods with them yeah i'm, tr I'm just trying to find uh you know i uh, i used to have a problem i just forced them to do it <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. I, I'm actually currently working on our, our next Algonquin series where we took Cedar into the backcountry um, uh, when he was only, he would have only been about eight months old at, at the time uh, last year. But yeah, yeah <clears throat> and we had the bear come into our campsite. <laughs> so it, it'll be entertaining to watch. But uh, right. yeah, it, I, I think it's a really interesting topic because so many kids nowadays are going to grow up um, remembering a time in their lives, sorry, not being able to remember a time in their lives when they didn't have screens in their lives. Yeah. will be able to remember a time when they weren't, say, a backcountry camper. Yeah. Uh, so it was really important to us that the opposite 
uh, was true. And so we've really wanted Cedar to grow up not remembering a time in his life when he wasn't a backcountry camper and then social media and screens and all that sort of jazz comes later on so that he has like something to ground himself to right uh, when all that stuff becomes overwhelming because social media like it's let's, let's all be honest like it's not the greatest but at the same time i think that's what all parents want for the kids yeah and, and you know what's What's funny is my feelings on it. It's my personal opinion is I think what embodies a great parent. And for me, like in my aspiration to be a better dad and the best dad that I can be is to give them more than I ever had. Right. Oh, and in that, I want to share my experiences in life with them and then pass on knowledge. But I want them to do better. I don't yes. want them to mess up the same ways I have. You know, like it goes with that old saying, like, uh, do as I say, not as I done. Yeah. You know uh yeah. otherwise you're just gonna look at a world of strife and pain you know like like we said earlier you want to yeah. be gotta be tough yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. and in that if you decide to take that path that's cool too i love you i love you you know you can do whatever you want but yeah. i'm gonna try and steer you the other way here and show you you know how that i mean look at me look at all these scars <laughs> and, and i am happy you know what i mean and mm -hmm. yes you have a great life and we do have a lot to show from all that pain and strife but you could take an easier route you do not have to do it you know what i mean unless you want to you want to go and like be a daredevil and do crazy stuff and uh and do that sort of thing yeah it's all you and and i'll have your back the whole way i'll be there with pom-poms cheering you know <laughs> it's like, yeah i yeah. get it yeah uh, i just want to say a couple of things um uh, before we get back to the uh, the subject matter for tonight, which is uh, you know, oopsies <laughs> out in the woods or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. up north of sixties, asking Chris if you could talk a little bit about your training routine leading up to an Ironman, diet, supplementation, and recovery. If you could just take mm -hmm. a couple of minutes, if you're interested, just to sort of outline a few things for for Dave. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, you. And I'll preface this by saying training for an Ironman is uh, like a really selfish endeavor, if I'm being entirely honest. So like you, you have to be able to devote um, about 15 to 20 hours per week, uh, week after week. That's, that's like training for a fight. That's like sparring and training. But. Yeah, but I, I always tell people like it's, yeah, it, it's, it's like the... I equate it to like the hardest manual labor you can think of. Uh, so you're out there redlining on a bike uh, and you might like, you might be really tired at the end of the day. You might work like an eight hour shift and then you had to go out and you have to bike like 200 kilometers uh, and put in like a really long training ride or, or like you had to put in like a four kilometer swim in the pool or you had to go out and like run like a half marathon. Uh, and like, it's just, it, 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 the training really piles up every week. And when you do it every single day, six days a week, sometimes seven days a week, week after week, month after month for nine months, uh, like it really, it takes a toll on the body. Um, and the and, mind. What's that? Sorry. And the mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, so it, if you're going to do an Ironman, like you have, like, I like, gosh, as a parent right now, I can't even like imagine or fathom trying to do it. Um, but like, you have to be able to carve out a lot of time for it. Um, and you have to, you have to be really careful uh, and really smart about your, your naturally your nutrition as well. So we consume a lot of protein to repair the body overnight. Um, yeah, because if you're doing like every day for six days a week, like yeah. you're not giving your body that you know the day to recover in between yeah and generally you try not to do like two big back uh bikes back to back uh so you'll do like a bike one day and then you'll do the, a run the next day and then a swim the next day uh and um just try to mix it up on a regular basis um but like it's logistically challenging on a day-to-day -day basis like if you think about like all the gels and the nutrition that you need to carry for like a 200 kilometer training ride, like it's just like, it starts to add up. Uh, and right. like, for instance, like over the course of a summer, like we'll spend like, you know, like 
three or four hundred dollars on sunscreen alone and like, <laughs> just ridiculous <laughs> amounts of money on uh, gels and uh, protein powders and all these things and yeah it's so the time commitment is is kind of ridiculous because uh, you're you're averaging about three hours a day um, week after week month after month that does uh, that does uh, kind of Seem reminiscent of like, like how, you know, uh, 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 fighters, they train a similar way, you know, yeah. like unless you're sponsored. I mean, no one can can afford to train eight hours a day unless they're sponsored and they're getting ready for like a title, you know. But like these guys, they're doing a minimum of three to four hours a day and then completely honing their diets, like to to put on as much or reduce as much as they can to make weight, and mm -hmm. then sparring all day it takes a lot out of you and then they go to work and then they get off and go spar again you know what i mean so it's like yeah it's a similar and, similar thing huh but yeah a similar thing I, I tell people who are thinking about doing an iron man you almost have to be like a bit of a semi-professional athlete um and you have to become like really proficient at, at all three well, yeah all three disciplines um, you know it it's funny because like uh, last November, or maybe it's the November before. I think it was last. Um, I went with my my wife to Nevada or Arizona, Nevada, because she was she was doing a half marathon in um, Las Vegas. Um, I will say one thing about that. All right, Austin's. <laughs> um, I think Las Vegas could drop into the sand, and it wouldn't piss me off at all but it is surrounded by spectacular countryside but the thing that i was going to say is even just doing a half marathon she was running a lot like yeah. I, I was single dadding a lot so that she could do this and then i went sort of to, to do support for her and like whatever you need i'll run and stuff i'll run around and get your your stuff but even for that it, it, it was a major time commitment major and commitment. so if you're if you're adding on everything to do an iron man yeah it's like I can hardly imagine it with you know with kids and stuff. Yeah, it, and again, I I tell everybody who's thinking about doing one, uh, it's an incredibly selfish endeavor, um, and yeah, it's <laughs> you just uh, gosh, you had to devote so much time to it. it. It's almost it's like having a part time job on top of your your normal nine to five. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Jesse, yeah. you're uh, talking about um, like the biggest oops you've made going outdoors and talk about completely being thrown into the weeds unprepared. So let me show you something. So you see this mountain over here? Yeah. So there's a lot of different parts of that mountain. You see all those windmills? Barely. Really? So all those windmills up there are protected by military personnel and it's a private area. It's full federal and you can't go up there. And okay. uh, there's a trail that runs right over there. It's called the Poly Trail. And I've hiked that one all the way to the top. But I used to work on the right of that mountain. There's a plantation up there I used to work at. And I was uh, I worked wood fire there. I was a saute chef. And uh, every day I'd go to work and see this area. And I'd like, all right. I'm going to hike up that mountain going all the way to the top. And uh, okay. friends, so one night, I'm going to be as concise as I can. And uh, so that way I don't drag you on. I uh, got five friends together, okay? Yeah. And uh, we all work in kitchens. So we got okay. started this hike at 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. And we all decided to do a candy flip. You know what a candy flip is? No. So we eat a hit of mushrooms and you take a hit of acid. <laughs> Andy. No, no, I think I know where this story is going, but please continue. Yeah. Okay. Well, so we begin the hike and it's turned out beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Amazing hike. And you know, yeah. and, you know, we split up like like this guy's we found a tractor and this guy's decided to go smoke a joint on the tractor. This was like ten years ago, mind you. And uh they go to smoke a joint on the tractor, and then my friend Davin, he's like, Hey Johnny, 
It's like, look, man, I didn't come up here to mess around. I came up here to get to the top. You coming with me? Because I know I see these guys want to sit here and get high and mess around. I'm like, no, nah, I'm with you. I came up here to get the top too. Let's go. So we split up. Me and Davin go up. And uh, we're heading up. And then we hear a machine cranking up. And uh, he oh, no. coming up the hill. And then we're watching. We're almost at, probably about a quarter mile from the top of that mountain. And then I look down and I'm seeing my friends get busted. There's like these guys on an ATV and they're tying them up. And I, what's going on? And, uh, and he's like, he's like, dude, Johnny, it's time to get down and take cover. They're coming for us. They go and they got them tied up on a wagon on the back of this thing. And they're coming up for us. And then we dunk down and I'm like freaking out at this point. I'm like, man, they're, dude, that's it. We're done. They're going to come get us. You know, this is it. It's over. He's like, calm down, Johnny, calm down. Everything's going to be all right. They'll go past us. I'm like, go past us. There's nothing over there, but cliff. There's nowhere to go. We're at the end of a cliff right now. And, and there's nowhere to go. And he's like, just stay calm. Stay calm. I'm like, okay. So I lay down I have my back edge, of like, like an eight foot drop. And they go, and sure enough, they go right putting past this, can see them, you know what I mean? And they got AR-15s. There's like four of them, and they got ARs, and they've got the guys, and they've got them tied up. And I'm like, I look at my friend Dad, and I'm like, they're going to kill us. They're taking us hostage, and they're going to kill us. You know, and that's what's going through my head. And, uh, and he's like, calm down, calm down, you know? And then they're coming back. And I'm like slowly doing a sidestep back towards the edge of the tree line and sure enough they shine over the side and they got their gun straight in his fist and they're like where's the gun at and he's all what gun so you guys up here hunting right what are you hunting for where's the gun at take off your pack we're gonna open your pack we're gonna see everything you got and i'm like watch them do this you know from the side i'm not saying anything i'd like a camel back on with minimal gear i had a ferro rod and a knife and a, a couple of flashlights my phone and a 12 pack of beer. And, <laughs> of course you did. And of course I, you did. Beer yet. I got the 12 pack in my I'm tripping. You know what I mean? And uh, they take him. They're like, we're going to blow your damn head off unless you take your pack off right now. And then he goes and he has a pack. And then they find he has a 22 on. Damn. Hmm. And then they look and there's an empty beer can next to him. And they look at each other and hear him say, there's another one out there on the hill. And I'm like, oh, man, they, they know about me. You know, and they're like, get him. And I was scared, you know. I rolled off the side of that cliff and then hit a riverbed on my stomach and slid. I slid a while and then crawled on my stomach for about a quarter mile. And then I found this ridge. I fell into this ditch and buried myself. I buried myself and stayed there. Like I told myself, I was like, you know, I'm just going to sleep here until they go away. Like I could stay here overnight, but right. I didn't have water. All the things that I could have brought, I didn't bring my canteen full of water and was completely dehydrated. And I was laying there with ants crawling all over my face and getting bit. And they walked over me three times. And then they were putting around, you know, where is he? Where is he? We're going to get yeah. Okay. Started at eleven. The perfect perspective for you. I was out there. I uh, hit the ridge. I hit up in the tree line. Johnny, breaking up on us here. Oh, sorry. I uh, I was up on the tree line and watched my friends get taken away from way up in the tree line. Yeah. And then um, I came out of my hiding and then had to scale a cliff and was literally crying because I had to scale it without any gear. And I made it out. It took me four hours. I got out at five in the morning and then ran down the highway and made it made it back to a regular highway and then called some friends to come pick me up. But my friends were uh, they had ARs in their head the whole time. So a lot of people, when they go out, they don't think about being taken. And that was what I was going to tell you, like. How do you prepare for, for like encountering like terrorists and what are they hiding? They're hiding like some kind of meth lab up there or something, you know? So mm -hmm. we, it's, you can stumble onto something 
that that shouldn't be there and then easily be taken. So that was like like the worst hiking experience I ever had in my life. But I am grateful for it because I know now. Like, you gotta watch out. For it. Fair enough and, and terrifying. Yeah, what happened is my get this. So the the cops show up, and the cops are friends with them, and give mm. hugs to all the guys that got the ERs, and then take them. And they all got arrested, and then never charged. They're like, don't ever go up there again, and just cut them loose. Mm. And we're all like. Like when I group back up with them, asking them what happened to them, you know, and they happened to me. Like, I, you know, all I had to tell them is like what I told you, like I got away, you know, and then, and then they're like, oh, we got held at gunpoint, you know, for like four hours while they hunted you. And then they couldn't find you. And we could hear them talking about seeing like, you know, broken sticks in different places where they thought you may have gone. Yeah. And the whole time we're sitting there listening to them, try and catch you. You know, and it was classic, man. You know, it, it's interesting being hunted too. You know, it really. You it's go a philosophical from, way of looking at it. You go, you go from being the prey, being the prey, mm -hmm. and you're being hunted. It's a completely different mindset. You start to think about like, if I were hunting me and I wanted to kill me, what would I do? And then what would I do to actually evade that? You know, it's it's interesting. That's it, a whole series of thoughts that I've never really considered having to go through oh yeah imagine thinking all that crap with a head full of acid mm. <laughs> Man. you know it's funny because a couple of times in the side chat here some someone's made a joke about this live stream should be called the nine lives of johnny and <laughs> now you've just sort of like yeah excuse me while i change the title <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty crazy story. I don't, I don't have anything to top that. My, uh, my friends won't hike with me anymore. <laughs> Any no. wonder? They won't. <clears throat> I invited them on uh the next, and you know I've invited them night diving, and now I just take my twelve year old daughter with me, because you know, and then I, <clears throat> I know my twelve year old daughter's got bigger balls than you guys. You guys really don't want to man up. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, it's funny, man. <laughs> so I wind up, you know, and then I, I show off like how much fish we get to the boys, you know, and like mm -hmm. all the great pictures of what we do. And they're like, giants, just what we've been through. We don't want to go through that again. I'm like, it wasn't my fault. I had Yeah, but you're you're probably triggering for their PTSD or something. I, was, I, I, I did not plan on that happening. I had no idea. It was supposed to be. It wasn't supposed to be like, you know, a commander. like by a bunch of crazy guys like running a meth lab you know what i mean it it, it just went downhill so fast it was, yeah like and then my my bad on my part and get this so when they got the guys in the custody they were trying to flush me out so i had my phone in this front pocket i was wearing these exact clothes except i had a black hoodie on and uh they started calling my phone to try and locate me they wanted to hear the ring and track me right so I uh, did a pocket dump. I turned my uh, camelback upside down and I went and I turned off my phone and dumped everything, everything I had in my pockets into my camelback. So it wouldn't even be jingling at keys or anything. I was like going full blackout. No lights, no headlamp. This thing went in, everything. No lights, nothing. I just crawled and just kind of, then I just crawled out of there like and climbed. It was, it was so scary. It was one of the most scariest experiences I've ever had in my life. Hmm. <laughs> but, you know, so the, like experience a lot of people like you go on a nice hike. A lot of people, normal people don't think about that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, like. <laughs> and Johnny, you broke my rule about not discussing guns on my channel. Oh, I'm sorry. Damn you. I, I, won't, I won't talk about my weapons training in the forces. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and, and I am. I apologize. I didn't know. I wasn't aware of that. Rule. It's okay. That story was good enough that I was just like, I gotta know where this goes. I, I gotta know where this goes. I, I apologize. Yeah. Uh, guns aren't really like my thing, you know. But being having one held to your your head or your friend's head, it, it's pretty nerve wracking. Yeah. It's like it's a it's an extremely nerve wracking thing. Uh, it'll it'll change your whole perspective on everything. Yeah. 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 
Um, like, how the hell do you follow that story up? I was just going to say, guys, I put the, the the link down below. Anyone who wants to get on and tell us about a little oopsie that happened while they were in the woods. And no one's going to be like, well, I, I had a story that I thought was big, but kind of not anymore. Hey, Dennis is in the, in the chat. Dennis, uh, should come say hi. <laughs> Got to hit the lawn, Jesse. I really appreciate you having me on. It was a pleasure meeting you. Nice and, meeting you, Johnny. Yeah. I got free and going uh, and knock down some branches and jazz. That way the neighbors don't get upset and so it stays nice and produces fruit. Right. Okay. See you later, yeah. Johnny. Thank you so much for having me on. And it's been a pleasure chilling with you guys. Yeah. See yeah, you. likewise. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Y'all have a great night. You too. You too. Now, I um, I have this philosophy that if ever you see Johnny and he's not smiling, the world is coming to an end because that guy has smiled through some crazy crazy stories uh, that is quite the story hey dennis hey chris hey there jess how you doing i'm all right how are you hey yeah. i'm doing okay i don't think i could i, I don't think i could follow up that story either <laughs> yeah. chris, you, you, you yourself must have some some harrowing stories uh, for I, I i come in late don't forget i come in late so what miss miss um uh, misfortunes in the back country well uh, th the thing that that sort of uh, inspired me was the epic um computer failure i had last thursday and how it's sort of thrown a lot of my channel kind of into disarray i have to rethink how i do stuff until i get my computer back up and going yeah um and it sort of made uh, it, it sort of uh, started a whole chain of um thoughts in my head about how you know it's funny how when everything happened, I stopped and took a breather, you know, because of how we're taught that when you're in the woods, you get lost, stop, take a breather, take a drink of water and how it's interesting how I said how too often there, but, and how interesting it is that the same steps are so portable across your whole life. You know, you learn something about, you know, in the forest, you get lost. Don't lose your head because if you lose your head, you may make a, a fatal mistake. The same thing happened. You know, I mean, I, I used to work on construction sites uh, for my summer job. My first summer job, uh, I did it five summers in a row out in BC, you know, working construction. Someone makes a mistake and he loses his head. Well, he could like literally kill himself. Whereas, you know, so if somebody made a mistake, everyone's like, whoa, okay. We all all right? Okay, how do we fix that? No matter where you look, it, it, the theory main, you know, remains really, really solid. Don't lose your head, and you can pull out of this. Ninety nine point nine percent of the time, and uh, you know, and I was thinking like how Chris and I each each have a story about you know having an epic, you know, bike fall up, uh, you know, uh, tumble off a bike, and some you know everyone. I know has a story of, you know, dunking themselves out of their canoe at just the wrong time and how it doesn't, that's all just in some ways that that's all just the drapes, right? Mm -hmm. the, the fundamentals are the same. And so I thought it'd be fun to just ask people what their best sort of disaster stories are. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and then, of course, Johnny came and blew the whole thing apart with his epic, <laughs> his epic story. Where, where's Johnny from? He lives in Hawaii. Hawaii, okay. That that, yeah. that explains the uh, palm trees and stuff in the background. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, yeah. What about you, Dennis? Like any moments in the back of tree where like things kind of go wrong and you had to big yourself out or. <sighs> Not, 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 not an epic fail or anything like that on my end. Uh, I think, I think one of the worst experiences that we ever had on a canoe trip one time was uh, we're we're up in the Tomogamy area, up around Cedar or not Cedar Lake, um, Jumping Caribou, and we had had a guy that was on the trip with us who was a friend of my best friend. Right, they worked together, and this guy made out like he was like you know, Mr. Canoe guy and stuff like that. And only to find out that like, you know, when he, he shows up, his food rations were nothing but Mr. Noodles and pepperonis. Mm. And 
he didn't have proper gear and it just went one thing after another after another and we're two days into that rainy trip when he decided he wanted to bail on us right right and cooler heads that really had to prevail there because first off when you're in when you're into something like this and people are relying on you because you know you got two tandem canoes or in, in this case i think there are three tandem canoes going and we had to, to figure out what to do well we happened to be close to highway 11 and sure enough we said okay let's take a day you know let the cooler heads prevail you know try and get ourselves through this whole situation and maybe you know let's find a solution to this essentially we were offering them gear we're offering them our food and after losing another day because we wanted to stay at one spot just to sort of get them to come around you still ended up bailing on us. We we're close to Highway 11. We had to paddle on the Highway 11. He hitchhiked home. Right. Wow. So, yeah, you know, it's that that's that's probably one of the worst experiences we ever had on a trip. Uh, the trip got totally altered from there because no longer could we do the trip we wanted just based on having one person, which was me, because I was most experienced paddling an 18 foot. Uh, um, Voyager canoe, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's uh, by yourself. Yeah. So we we ended up altering the trip, and like you say, you, you start thinking it through, and you find out a solution that's going to make it better, right? Yeah. Uh, so, but lesson to people: don't ever bail on your buddies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's that seems like really <laughs> crass yeah. to me, you know. Yeah. And you know, the funny thing is I've heard other people tell of stories like that too, where somebody's bailed on them in the middle of a trip. They're just not cut out for it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's funny cause I, uh, I like to think of myself as very, as a canoe enthusiast more than like an expert because I'm not, um, but I wouldn't like if if I wouldn't invite myself to that kind of trip if I was the type who would bring Mr. Noodles and salam and you know salami. Yeah. You know, because you have to consider the possibility that you're going to be wasting everyone's time. Uh, it just seems so selfish to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I'm Mr. Canoe, mess up the trip for everyone, hitchhike home. Yeah. Dude, you're leaving some guy to, to paddle an 18 footer alone. Uh, back back <clears throat> back in them days when I was younger, I, I kind of had some anger issues and stuff like that. And I'll tell you, <laughs> at one point or, or another, <clears throat> they had to hold me back. I was, <laughs> I was yeah. ready to kill the guy, right? But uh, no, cooler heads prevailed, and like I say, it ended up working out good. We ended up having a really good trip, nonetheless. Yeah. But it wasn't the trip that we had planned, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. Bummer. Bummer, bummer. <clears throat> uh, Hawaii volcano. So nothing wrong with salami, but when, you know, the guy comes for a, a big trip with nothing but Mr. Noodles and salami. Actually, it wasn't even salami. You remember, I don't even know if they still sell these things. Remember, the, they, they, they're like a pepperoni stick called a hot rod. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He had, he had Mr. Noodles and hot rods. Well prepared. Yeah. Hey, Steve. Hey, how you doing? Can you hear Hey, Steve. Me? How you doing? Yeah. Hi, Steve. Um, how, how do you folks respond to like really inclement weather? Like, like the weather gets terrible. Uh, are are you of the mindset that like you forge through a little bit of it, or do you um, step back? Do you reevaluate? How how do you folks handle bad weather? I get really quiet, hunch my shoulders, and keep walking <laughs> because I don't enjoy it, but I. I, I like to, I like, I don't, I'm not very demonstrative about stuff like that. Like I'm, I'm not the type of, guy, oh, oh God, you know, my daughter's like that drives me nuts, but I, I just, oh. and you know, if anyone tries to talk to me, I'm like, oh, just let me do this. Just let me get going. I kind you of know? like rain and wind. Well, a light wind and wind is, is, is nice, but if you end up getting like, I think what Chris is talking about is like, you're getting pissed on and maybe you didn't, you weren't prepared for it. Right. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I have an interesting story that happened to me in Algonquin park uh, with lightning and thunder where I was doing a, 
we were in a, a college orientation and uh, we had a, a 24 hour period where they took us and put us on some isolated place where we kind of made our own campsite and made our own um, shelter out of a tarp. And we're supposed to reflect or something. And, and it was thunder and lightning all through the night. And I kept hearing these trees falling down. But I was uh, 18, so I was invincible. So I don't know. I miss being 18 and invincible. <laughs> you know, what, what we do, Chris, is we, uh, we kind of learned our lessons years ago when it comes to, to rainy weather. So basically, we'll, we'll take a what would be a four or five day canoe trip and now that'll get older too right turn we'll turn that into a seven day trip mm -hmm. so we we take into consideration the factors that like you know we want to have a fishing day or we want to have a layover day right and we'll tend to use them layover days when we know the weather's going to be pretty inclement right mm -hmm. that way there you don't have to worry but if you string together three or four days of you know bad weather wind rain where you're, you're wind bound sometimes you just have to chomp the bullet and you know march forward right yeah. but we we've not run into that situation on any of our trips over the years that uh we've actually been stranded for more than say a day yeah so martin has a good story about that about being we kind back. of work it into our planning though just hoping like this this i'll give you an example our, our big trip that we did this year we had the whole week ex with the exception of two days were, were just crap, wind, rain, cold, right? And we just pick and choose when we could paddle. But we got caught in a hailstorm, <laughs> like a really bad hailstorm. Uh, we got caught with some really big winds, you know, so, but we, we made our way through. Yeah. It's a good thing we took the extra days, though, because we could do that trip in four days, and we did seven. But I also think um, getting to what Chris's original question was, um, is that inclement weather, like if, if everything goes wrong when you're in the middle of, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're in the middle of a lake due to inclement weather, uh, that could be a lot, much, much worse than, you know, you're on a hike and suddenly everything's a drag, yeah. you know? I think that, the you know, it takes more skills to, to get out of, you know, a big oopsie in the middle of a lake on a, on a canoe or a kayak than it does. You know, ah, my feet are wet. They've been wet for three days. Yeah. Ah, I hate life, you know? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I, I love a good snowstorm. It sounds really funny, but like, like I grew up in Sault Ste. Marie uh, where they get just a crap ton of snow all the time, right? And yep. love snow. I love being out in snowstorms. Uh, it's hard to describe, but I... I just love it. Uh, but when it comes to lightning, I've had some pretty bad experiences uh, being out on the water. And it, I, so I come from a, also come from a competitive rowing background. Uh, and I can remember days out in the middle of the lake where all of a sudden your crewmate's hair in front of you starts standing up in the air. Um, no, that's not good. Yeah, that's like charge building up in the air, I think. Yeah. Um, and I think that's like the most terrifying moment I've ever lived through in my life. Um, and so I, I have like a little PTSD uh, every time there's uh, some lightning uh, around us. And like, I, I do not take any risks uh, with lightning whatsoever. So if, if I've heard lightning off in the distance, uh, immediately start hugging the shoreline because uh, mm -hmm. I have no idea how far away it is. And I, I treat that much differently than I do snowstorms, for example. Right. Yeah, that's definitely something you want to get off the water for. It's like yeah. your thunder, start making your way towards shore. Yeah. Yeah. Us people from Hawaii don't have those kind of uh, thunderstorms. We have, we don't have lightning strikes around here. So you, you don't have lightning yeah, strikes? Okay. No, not really. Uh, well, I mean, may, I suppose there are, but uh, we don't have the kind of huge thunderstorms and those bolts of lightning that you have on the mainland. Huh. We have a lot of gentle, gentle things. I suppose during hurricanes, maybe. But um, 
Right. <clears throat> interesting. Very interesting. Oh, okay. It's after 11. So we're, uh, oh my God. Hawaii Volcano Squad has been waiting to come on. But we're after 11. I'll just let him come on to say hi. Hi. Sorry, dude. I didn't notice you there. Um, okay. I'm used to being ignored. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. We'll get you on next time. Uh, so for everyone who hung out in the side chat, um, thanks for hanging out with us. For everyone who came on, Chris, I'm glad to uh, to finally have you on to uh, to chat. Um, yeah, Dennis, it's always great to have you on. Hey, hey Steve, you, you've working. never seen lightning here in Hawaii? Because I have. No, no, we have lightning. We just don't have um, the kind of thunderstorms that they have on the mainland. That's all. Yeah, well, I've had seen thunderstorms here on the Big Island, but not like not like on the mainland. Um, That's funny. Yeah. I wanted to say to Chris, I really like your work, and it was inspiring me to go back to uh, do can uh, Canadian uh, canoeing again. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think Steve has a trip planned coming up. Well, if yep. he can yep. cross the border. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So uh, that's all for tonight. See everyone next Tuesday, I hope. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay sane. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye.